so yet again, I will have my standard line here. This we could spend all term talking about. Um, RNA tumor viruses is what everybody called retroviruses before the discovery of HIV and some of these other um, particular viruses. So um, I could also probably say the same thing for the next two lectures because the giant viruses, which are actually somewhat related to the pox viruses, and then the viruses of Archaea, followed by review, followed by next Tuesday, week from Tuesday, I should say, 8 a.m. here, we all know what's happening. Good? Yes? No? Um, quick review on the pox viruses. Again, we talked a little bit about disease, but mostly about vaccinate, 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 and how amazing it is, in fact, that smallpox has been completely eliminated. Um, and the main reason for that is Shelby Kugendahl. The list. Main reason that smallpox is gone. Vaccine and what else? What was the Achilles heel that Donald Henderson mentioned? What, what, does, what does smallpox infect? What's the reservoir species? So it's, yeah, it's just humans. So that's really the main, one of the main reasons we're actually able to get rid of it. If you've got something with a narrow host range, you can vaccinate everybody and uh, have it be taken care of. One thing that I didn't mention is you probably also noticed that Somalia was the last place where they had active disease and probably would be impossible currently in Somalia to did what, do what they did in the 70s because just the political situation there. So um, there are also some historical reasons why we were able to actually completely eliminate smallpox. Um, genome is really fascinating because of course it's got these interesting structures at the ends which in, in terms of their structure anyway, look a lot like the parvoviruses, so the smallest DNA viruses and the largest DNA viruses so far that we've talked about um, have probably really similar kinds of genome replication, which I think is really fascinating uh, that evolution has had these two real extremes and have very similar kinds of processes. Um, replication and transcription, of course, are that these are practically autonomous viruses, almost like their own little cells. They only really need translation to make sure that they can actually make their proteins and then eventually make their virions. So otherwise, they have practically all the proteins that come with them, and many of those actually even come in with the virion um, in the first place. Um, there are some strange differences in terms of transcription, particularly having to do with the messenger RNA processing. Um, and then how they get out is also really interesting because you can sometimes have two membranes around the outside and sometimes just have one. And did anybody have a chance to check out the sh really short video at the end that I linked with the rockets running around? Uh, that's really amazing that, again, evolutionarily, you've evolved a protein that causes actin polymerization that can help you get from one cell to the other. Again, still evolution such a wonderful thing. Um, any more questions about pox viruses? Yeah. Today's lecture? Um, I thought that I'd uploaded it, but maybe I didn't. That's distinctly possible that I did not. I will do so. Please remind me, send me an email, and I'll make sure that it does get uploaded. Um, I am recording it, so at least that part will be up. But yeah, I'm sorry. I, for some reason, I may have just forgotten to upload it. Um, that happens. Me, my you know, mind like a steel sieve. Other questions, comments, worries about the pox viruses. So <clears throat> again, we could spend all term talking about these retroviruses. Specifically, retroviruses that we'll talk about here are those that have a positive strand packaged inside the virion, but has a DNA intermediate, which is important for virus replication, actually absolutely essential for virus replication. The RNA in and of itself is not sufficient. It has to go through a DNA intermediate. And there was literally, I think two days ago, I saw a paper that just came out that's trying to put lots of viruses that replicate in similar ways that have DNA intermediates, but also RNA intermediates, have RNA and DNA, um, as a separate order of viruses above and beyond families. And so thinking about 
We also have viruses that replicate through RNA that package DNA, and but still have to have a reverse transcription step that goes through them. So there are a whole number of variations on the theme, particularly in terms of what gets packaged. And so this makes that whole Baltimore classification, <clears throat> you remember you know, how you make the messenger RNA and what you package in terms of your virion makes it very confusing because if you're packaging RNA, yet you have to go through DNA and reverse transcription, what kind of Baltimore class of virus is that? You know, 7A, 6B, you know, et cetera. So <clears throat> the original way that these viruses were found, again, was RNA tumor viruses. And RNA tumor viruses should sound really, really strange. OK, who's, on, who's next on the list? Margo, why is an RNA tumor virus really bizarre? Why is a RNA tumor virus very, very strange? What does this not correlate with as far as what we know about cancer? Yeah, rapidly dividing cells and DNA, but these are RNA viruses. So this was obviously a huge problem at the time, is how do you have an RNA virus which causes a genetic change, but all of us are using DNA? And so this was a big puzzle for long periods of time. And in fact, how people originally found oncogenes and learned a lot about cancer is in studying the RNA tumor viruses. Um, and that was, again, the vast majority. And I forget when this book was published. But let's see. Yes, in 1982, um, everything that people knew about retroviruses was RNA tumor viruses and had nothing to do with HIV. But fortunately, people had been studying RNA tumor viruses and knew something about reverse transcription before HIV was discovered. So they already had kind of a leg up, at were, as it were, in terms of research and understanding what was going on with HIV. Having a retrovirus wasn't that unusual. And it turns out that, as I've probably talked about far too many times, our genomes are just completely littered with these things. And so it's not surprising that um, there are viruses as well. And then if we have a chance at the end, we'll talk a little bit about the structure of particularly the HIV capsid, because I think anyway, and I published a paper on this, saying that I think it's similar to a much more important virus, namely SSV1, that we'll talk about in the very last lecture of the term. So a couple of important aspects about these retroviruses. Uh, probably the most important one, certainly, tagging on to what we talked about in terms of the parvoviruses and the pox viruses. All of these guys use DNA primers for replication. We've also talked about viruses that have protein primers for replication. Retroviruses use tRNAs for primers for replication, which is, again, really quite different. But for evolutionarily, it makes a bun bunch of sense because there's a bunch of tRNAs around. So it makes sense in terms of using those as primers. Um, frame shifting we've talked about before um, is actually best understood in a lot of these retroviruses, how frame shifting works. And as a reminder, frame shifting is all about translation. It's not about transcription. It's all about the translation process. So it's the ribosome moving relative to the RNA, which is <coughs> translating. Um, there is a certain amount of splicing that happens in these viruses. So a question that Stedman may or may not have asked in previous exams and may ask in future exams, um, which viruses have splicing, which viruses don't. So um, something to think about. And the splicing in these retroviruses is absolutely essential. If you don't have splicing, you don't have a functional retrovirus. Reverse transcription, of course, is kind of what defines the retroviruses going from RNA to DNA. But it's not just RNA to DNA. Um, the reverse transcriptase goes from RNA to DNA and DNA to DNA um, because that's the process. And some people say it's kind of a Baroque process in terms of genome replication. And we'll spend a while talking about that. Um, integration, we've talked about integration already in terms of proviruses and lambda. And then in some cases where we have integration like AAV, still not quite sure how that happens, but you do have some integration that takes place there. Um, 
these so-called long terminal repeats. So we've talked about inverted terminal repeats a bunch for various different viruses. These now have direct repeats at the termini of the provirus. And the provirus is what's sitting down in the genome. Those long terminal repeats are critical for function um, and are generated during this kind of Baroque replication process. A certain amount of template switching happens. Um, this really has mostly to do with, excuse me, how did that happen? Um, the <coughs> process of recombination and mutation that happens. Hopefully everyone knows one of the big problems with HIV therapy is there are lots of mutations that happen. Um, part of that is template switching and part of it also has to do with just the nature of the reverse transcriptase which is very low fidelity. Turns out that template switching is not just important for mutational purposes, also is absolutely required for the replication process. This is interesting, and I'm not even trying to run it with my phone this time. <sighs> Fun with technology. We'll see how it goes. Um, so again, we'll talk a little bit about origin and disease for retroviruses. We'll talk about HIV disease a little bit later on, a bit about the structure, how they get in. But the main thing here, of course, is replication. How do you go from RNA to DNA into the genome? Transcription is actually pretty straightforward with a big exception for HIV, but less so for some of the other retroviruses. So retroviruses, everything before, again, the discovery of these immunodeficiency viruses was all about tumor viruses. So sarcoma viruses, tumor viruses, leukemia viruses, leukemia viruses, sarcoma viruses. And most of these were the ones that people were working on, and not surprisingly, people were interested in cancer and how cancer could be formed by these particular viruses. And as it turns out, it's not so much regulation of the cell cycles, which we talked about with those DNA viruses. These are actually very specific genes, which turn out to be important for cancerous development and originally the discovery of these oncogenes. So we'll talk about those as well. Um, and then, of course, the, the reverse transcriptase. A very general case of most of these RNA tumor viruses is like this, and as we'll see, HIV is just a slight modification of this. They've all got, well, let's just start here, surface proteins, these trimeric proteins, again, trimeric surface proteins bind to receptors, not surprisingly. Have a transmembrane protein, this is where that fusion peptide is enclosed in this transmembrane protein. They've got matrix proteins. These have a space in between the membrane and the capsid. It's not really called the tegument because the herpes virologists say we're the only ones who are allowed to have a tegument. Um, but there's some space between a membrane and a capsid on the inside. So there's always a capsid present on all of these retroviruses on the inside of the membrane. Inside of that is a nucleocapsid, which is RNA plus protein. There also are always two copies of this RNA. All retroviruses always have two copies of that RNA present inside the virion. Exactly why that is is not completely clear, but it may have to do with this template switching that I talked about before. Um, tRNAs that are associated with this, again, these are going to be the primers that are used for replication. Most cells have reverse transcriptases in them, but usually not sufficient to replicate these viral genomes. Plus, as we'll see, reverse transcriptase is actually active in the virion. And so reverse transcriptase is brought along with the genome in the virion. Also, the viral integrase is brought along with the viral genome in the virion. And so this also means for packaging purposes, it's, you, know, you have to figure out how to get these things packaged appropriately into virions. There's also a protease, which is packaged inside each of these virions. So these are the proteins. What does the genome look like? This is, again, for your classic retrovirus, and HLV will be modifications hereof. What's packaged? Now, remember, two copies of this. They have a cap, completely normal, boring, dull cap, completely normal, boring, dull poly-A tail at the end. Um, these are all made by 
cellular processes, so not surprising that they're completely normal. What's different, of course, is what's between the cap and this poly A tail. There's a repeated sequence, again, creatively named R, um, which is a direct repeat at each end of the genome. There are unique sequences at the five prime end, unique sequences at the three prime end. You could also call these like the UTRs that you would think about in terms of messenger RNAs. And then there's a primer binding site followed by a major splice site. So all retroviruses have a major five prime splice site and a major three prime splice site basically to make all of the st mostly structural proteins. So structural protein surface and transmembrane protein, and then the GAG proteins, horribly named proteins, unfortunately, group-specific antigens. Huh? Uh, we talked about those different tumor viruses. You may have noticed alpha, beta, gamma, delta, et cetera. Those are the individual groups. Each of those groups have different antigens. And that's where they come from, where the antigens come from. They're what the immune system sees. They're all the structural proteins. So the group specific an um, antigens are matrix, nucleocapsid, and capsid. So your structural proteins are here at the five prime end and here at the three prime end. You have to have splicing to get your transmembrane proteins and surface proteins. No splicing to get these proteins. Then you have your non-structural proteins. And I put non-structural proteins in quotes because they're all in the virion, um, protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase, also known as the Paul genes. So GAG, Paul, ENV, groups of antigens, polymerase, and other enzymes, and envelope proteins. So all retroviruses have this kind of structure, GAG, Paul, ENV, and lots of people will talk about GAG, Paul, and ENV genes. One thing, hopefully, you'll notice is that the GAG gene and the polymerase genes overlap with each other. Um, they're also polyproteins. They're all hooked together as one open reading frame here. And it's the frame shift that takes place between here and here, which ends up giving you a polyprotein that includes GAG and Paul together. Um, but splicing, which is going to give you these envelope proteins. What this means, of course, is you have to have the activity of a protease in order to get all of these proteins to be functional. So what's the life cycle, or replication cycle, of these retroviruses? We'll look at these all in more detail in just a second. You have binding to receptors, fusion usually at the plasma membrane. The capsid is released. Inside the capsid, you have the activity of the reverse transcriptase, which will eventually will give you double-stranded DNA. That double-stranded DNA gets imported in the nucleus, where it gets inserted into the genome at a random or more or less random position in the genome. We'll see a little later that it's not completely random. Probably has to do with the compaction of genomes. Um, then once it's been inserted into the genome, now the cellular machinery will make messenger RNA. This messenger RNA gets translated, most of it as GAG-specific proteins. A few of them then have a frame shift, which makes GAG-Paul. This will then get proteolized to make the proteins that you need here. Also have your major splicing, giving you a shorter messenger RNA. This will give you your envelope proteins, transmembrane, and surface proteins. So again, we'll talk about each of these steps as we go through here. Let's first talk about this reverse transcription step here. So this is the one which now my computer is refusing to move as well. There we go. So <clears throat> this is the genome that comes inside your, <clears throat> it's got a you know, cap and a, a tail on it as well. tRNA, of course, is bound to that primer binding site. It's present in all retroviruses. But it's in opposite orientation, because you always get double strands that form you know, 5 prime to 3 prime, 3 prime to 5 prime. So your primer is right here, sticking basically in the wrong direction. So this is the substrate that the reverse transcriptase will bind to and extend this 3 prime OH 
out to the end of the genome. And in that process, generating the complement of this R sequence. So this is also known as the minus strand. So remember, positive strand, that's going to code for your proteins, but it's not used. Um, it's only actually then used to translate later if it's integrated in the genome. So minus strand makes this first stop right here. One of the activities of the RNA, sorry, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, otherwise known as reverse transcriptase, is also an RNase H activity. So this is all part of the reverse transcriptase. RNase H cleaves up RNA in an RNA-DNA hybrid. The brown here is DNA. That gives you a single-stranded complement of this repeat sequence. Where's another repeat sequence? Either here at the opposite end of the genome or on that other copy of the RNA, which you have it. So that recombination process between the two, template switching. Fun, 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 which can go on. So let's just use one RNA for simplicity's purposes. This complement of the repeat sequence goes to this other end of the genome. Now this is great because you have a primer, you have a template, you have a reverse transcriptase, that will replicate all the way out through the other end of the genome. One thing that happens now, you had that unique sequence at the five prime end over here. Now it's been moved over to the three prime end relative to this part of the genome. So when you have the copying that takes place here, you end up with complement of U3, complement of R, complement of U5. This guy goes out to the end and makes a complement of your primer binding site. So here we have an almost complete double strand, but now we have a 3 prime OH and a template here. Now the reverse transcriptase has a DNA dependent DNA polymerase activity. So it can copy this DNA. It copies the DNA until it gets to one specific position in this tRNA. And this position in that tRNA is a pseudouridine. Pseudouridine, as all of us remember from molecular biology, of course, is uridine, which has gotten flipped over and now can't base pair anymore. At least doesn't base pair in a normal Watson Crick form. So the reverse transcriptase gets to that point and stops. Now you still have activity of your RNase H. RNase H will chew up most of the RNA here, which was your template with the exception of this polypurine, for some reason, gets degraded a little bit slower. That serves as a primer for this piece. Now, finally, RNASH gets rid of your tRNA. We have a copy of the primer binding site now at the three prime end, a complement of that at the five prime end. This piece will go over here. This is now a primer with this template. Here we have a primer for that template and you generate the final DNA copy of the RNA that you started with, with extra copies at the ends. Yeah, Andrea. I'm a little confused as to what's the, what is the first, what causes the first strand transfer and what causes the second strand transfer? So strand transfer is just, you have this single stranded piece that's looking for a partner. And so there's nothing that causes it. It's just, it's gonna base pair with whatever it can base pair with. And that could either be the repeated sequence at the end of that same genome or the second genome which is inside the cell, one or the, one or the other of them. But it's just that it's a single-stranded DNA that's looking for a partner. Okay. Okay. And this happens simultaneously on two different strands, because they have that, right? Yes. Yeah. So the question is, is it happening simultaneously on both strands? Is it one versus the other? Those are really hard experiments to do, <laughs> and so it's not entirely clear whether you have one which is what gets um, transcribed or, an, or say reverse transcribed or the other one which is getting reverse transcribed and how much of this switching actually takes place. But you clearly have to have this switching from one end to the other end. And again, it happens twice because you have to have first this one that moves with your complement of the repeated sequence and then the complement of the primer binding site. But that's just a, a whether it's happening between the same molecules, two different molecules, Probably some of both. Yeah, do you have a question, Nicole? Or? Yeah. Yeah, 
so what's the RNase H de degrading? So RNase H just by definition degrades RNA and RNA and DNA hybrids. So wherever there's an RNA DNA hybrid, that RNA is going to get degraded. And so the RNA is black here. So at the beginning, this is the only place where you have an RNA DNA hybrid. So this will get degraded. It's always the RNA which is getting degraded. So we go from RNA here, which is black, to everything being orangish. Pardon? Which is, which is all DNA, correct. Yeah. This is, again, this, this is a rather convoluted process. And I've tried to find a decent animation to look at this. And I've yet to find a good one. And I'm not good enough at doing animations to make one myself. Step five. Yeah, so in step five is taking the black strand away, but really important is it doesn't get this one completely gone. Eventually it does get this degraded, but this one lasts long enough to serve as a primer for the reverse transcriptase to do this piece. Polypurine tracts. So this is a whole bunch of you know, repeated nucleotides. And I forget if it's polypurine or polypyrimidine. I always get them mixed up. What? And they just go t remind me. So I won't ask you which one it is. PPT. Good enough. And it's not PowerPoint. <laughs> well, that helps you remember. Great. OK, so what we've done now is, again, we've made a DNA copy, actually double-stranded DNA copy, of your genome plus copying the unique sequences from the three prime end and the unique sequences are five prime end. So you have both of them at either end of the genome. And this, as I say, is, is really important for the next steps. Yeah? So these long terminal repeats, these are direct repeats. So if they did, they would base pair with the other end and just end to end to end, end pieces as opposed to hairpins. So again, very different from what you see in adenovirus or um, pox viruses anywhere else. We've got inverted terminal repeats. These are now direct repeats. OK, so what does this job? Um, this wonderful reverse transcriptase enzyme. Um, there are many, many copies in the virion. So it's not just a single copy. We'll see probably why that is in just a second. Um, and it works literally in virions. And this is, in fact, how reverse transcriptase was originally discovered. Both Howard Temin and David Baltimore purified tumor viruses and then looked in vitro, again, in the absence of anything else, to see what kinds of activities they had. And to their great surprise, they found they had DNA polymerase activity based on RNA templates. Um, but it was you know, literally just purified from these. And again, then the replication process, that's all happening in the virion, and particularly inside the capsid of the virion, as it's coming inside the cell. These reverse transcriptases, everybody knows that a reverse transcriptase, at least hopefully everybody knows that reverse transcriptase, has an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So that's the RNA dependence making a DNA copy. But it also makes that second strand. You know, that what we just looked at on the last slide, that's all done by the reverse transcriptase. So it makes a second strand as well. It also has a DNA helicase activity, separating the two strands of DNA, also separating the RNA from the DNA. So it probably helps to get that transition going from one end to the other, that strand transfer. And also has RNase H activity. Um, and there's a specific RNase H domain that's hooked on to the end of the reverse transcriptase. So all of the viral reverse transcriptases, cellular ones don't all have these, um, have all of these activities. So what does that look like? <clears throat> Here's the reverse transcriptase structure down here at the bottom. And what does this structure look like? Let's see, we've got Alex, Paolo. No, Roslyn, what's the structure look like? Rachel, we'll get through the whole list if we're lucky. Ali? I can go through this whole list. I should skip back and go and find the other one. So 
Job, Richie. Yeah. It's yes. It's like uh, a DNA polymerase. A hand. Yes, a hand, the right hand. It looks like a DNA polymerase. So just like which one over here? Looks like poliovirus polymerase. Too. Which is what? Is that a DNA polymerase? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. No. What? What's the poliovirus polymerase? Another RNA. Oh, RNA, to RNA. RNA to RNA. RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So these reverse transcriptases um, were probably derived from RNA dependent RNA polymerases, and probably where all of the DNA polymerases um, came from as well. So reverse transcriptase, poliovirus polymerase, um, all have these very very similar structures. Big difference with the retroviruses is that they've got this extra RNase H domain um, up here at the top. So RNase H, but otherwise reverse transcriptase, normal, nice one, left hand, right handed structure. Yeah. And so you usually have actually a single protein that comes together, but sometimes you'll have both. And so on this particular image, you have, they have down there this P51 subunit. So it's actually a dimer of the reverse transcriptase. You don't seem to need a dimer. You can actually just have one, which is again, like most reverse trans, well, most RNA dependent RNA polymerases and others. But one of the things about DNA polymerases that we've learned about, and also about RNA dependent RNA polymerases is, Vishnu here? What's one of the things about these polymerases? Noof? Okay, we'll get through the whole list if we're lucky. Amy Lee? Brandon? The question is, what's very specific about these DNA polymerases? What's, what's different about the DNA polymerases versus these, you know, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, et cetera? You know, what are some of the aspects of these DNA polymerases? What do you usually have to have in terms of replication? Okay, you need a primer, definitely, and these guys have primers, it's the tRNA. What else is one of the aspects of most of the DNA polymerases? What else do you have to have? All the other replication factors, which are important for what? For initiation, but what else do they have to do? PCNA is kind of a hint. What's PCNA do? <laughs> so DNA polymerases um, have a tendency to fall off the DNA. What's that called? Processivity. So these have very low processivity, and that's why you've got that, the, all of those polymerases that you have to have in the virion, because if they fall off all the time, and that's also probably how you can get the template switching, which is happening, and these you know, polymerases coming off and on all the time. So multiple polymerases, and again, because they're DNA polymerases, there is no sliding clamp. There's no extra way of holding these guys onto the DNA. So that's probably how you have a lot of these you know, changes which are happening and helps also with the recombination purposes. Okay, so once we've finally gotten our double-stranded DNA with those direct repeats at either end, now we need to get it into the host genome. How does that work? Integration, not surprisingly, it's a protein, again, the integrase protein, that integrates randomly into the host genome, binds to the ends, now again, directly repeated sequences with you know, U3 and U5, U3 and U5 together. We'll cut off the ends of these, makes actually a slightly staggered cut, makes a staggered cut in the cellular DNA, integrates, make this nice loop structure. You have a couple of bases at the end, which then get repaired by repair polymerase. So you end up with a directly repeated sequence where you have integration that's taken place. Now the directly repeated sequence from your viral genome, other end of the viral genome, directly repeated sequence, and again a directly repeated sequence because you've cut this at random. So 
Random integration. Why am I sort of harping on this whole random integration process? Uh, this does seem to be dependent on the DNA being accessible. So it's in euchromatin, which is, again, it's not surprising because you've got to have this protein come in, find the DNA, cut it, and ligate the viral genome to it. So if it's completely compacted, it's unlikely that these are going to be places where you have integration of these retroviruses. So the um, process of integration is probably much more dependent on structure than it is on sequence. Yeah, do you have a question, Nicole? So the question that Nicole asked is, what about the cell cycle? And does it have to do with cell cycle dependence or not cell cycle dependence? As we'll see in just a second, uh, many retroviruses actually have to wait for the cell cycle to progress in order to get mostly the capsid and this intosome, as people call it. Again, horrible name. It's got the DNA plus the integrase um, into the DNA, and it can't get through the nuclear pore complex. On the other hand, HIV, as we'll talk about in just a second, actually has proteins which allow it to get through the nuclear pore. Um, but in many cases, it actually has to wait. And that probably is also then allows more differences. The thing with these, you know, HIV, which is not necessarily going into these actively replicating cells, um, how else are you going to have genome decompaction? And why are you going to have that? Something to do with nucleosomes, yes. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> So breathing, but what other process is happening throughout the cell cycle that's not replication? Transcription, exactly. So actively transcribed regions of the genome are very often where you have integration of these proviruses, which, again, turns out to be, as far as the viruses are concerned, great because that way you get transcribed a whole bunch more, and that's the only way you can make your genome. But from the cellular point of view, this can be a bit of a problem. And we'll see why that is in just a second. Okay, so we're in the genome. Woohoo! Finally made it there. Um, now we need to make our genome, because it has to be RNA. We also need to make all the proteins, because this is just our genome. So the long terminal repeat sequences. Long terminal repeats, LTRs, turn out to be fabulous promoters. So really great binding sites for all of the general transcription factors, the RNA polymerase, et cetera. And in fact, lots of molecular biologists, when they want to have a gene that gets really well expressed, you take the LTR, you put it in front of your favorite gene um, in order to get lots and lots of expression. Um, the transcription takes place right between the U3 and this repeat sequence. Again, this makes sense. That's where your transcriptional start is because that's where your final genomic RNA is going to be. Capping, again, completely normal processes. Not surprisingly, this is the cellular RNA polymerase 2. It's got the C-terminal domain hanging out the end of one of your subunits. It's got all of this capping proteins, splicing proteins, tailing proteins, etc., which are associated with it. Um, these make either spliced messenger RNA down at the bottom here, or non-spliced messenger RNA, which gets made into polyproteins. Um, there's also, again, this, you know, the poly-A tail formation happens right after this repeat sequence. One thing that you might notice, however, if this is the poly-A tail site, why the heck doesn't it make poly-A tails right here? Good question, right? Um, that's because there's suppression of termination right here at the very beginning. And how that works has to do with splicing and so on and so forth. We're not going to get into it. Um, but this is your classic CSTF you know, binding site that should be being used right here. But because of the co-transcriptional splicing, et cetera, it actually doesn't happen. Um, and then <clears throat> that leads to the read-through of this termination site. So you end up with these um, RNAs. To make this polyprotein from this full-length messenger RNA, you have to have frame shifting. This is now suppression of translational termination. Normally, and present for most of those gag proteins, again, group specific antigens, capsid, nucleocapsid, <coughs> um, and matrix protein, these normally will stop right here. There's a secondary structure in the messenger RNA that has this 
stop codon associated with it. Again, 90 plus percent of the time, the ribosome will stop here. It's this stop codon falls off. Some cases, however, you end up with a frame shift where the tRNA is here. Instead of base pairing to the normal base pairs as they do over here, they shift back a nucleotide. And now the ribosome says, hey, we can just keep going and make the whole rest of your polyprotein. But again, it's polyprotein. So all of this is made as one big protein. So what do you need to do? You need to chop these proteins apart. What does that? The protease. So we have our protease. That protease um, is just like we had with the picoRNA viruses and the flaviviruses, active as part of the polyprotein. Just doesn't like me here. Fortunately, there's one more week to go. Um, <clears throat> and we'll chop up these individual proteins. However, they do need to get transported to the plasma membrane. All of these viruses assemble at the plasma membrane. How does that happen? There's a fatty acid which gets added to the very end terminus of the gag protein. And so it literally will drag all of these gag proteins and the gag pol fusion protein to the membrane. And so that polyprotein gets taken to the membrane. The protease, as we'll see a little bit later on, is only functional after you've assembled your whole virus. Last thing I wanted to mention here is that there's this little psi sequence. And it's, no, it's not a pseudouridine, even though people use that for the same thing here. The psi sequence here is the packaging signal for this virus. The nucleocapsid protein binds to this packaging signal and then makes sure that this RNA gets packaged into capsids. Now, one of the really nice things about this psi, pro, uh, psi sequence, I should say, is that it's between the 5' and 3' splice site. So it means if you have spliced and have a messenger RNA that's encoding ENV, it doesn't have the psi site. So that RNA never gets packaged. So you only package the unspliced RNAs. OK, what's in these genomes? We've already talked about gag, pol, and env. How the heck do you get a tumor virus out of this? Well, as we mentioned, very often these are integrating into actively transcribed parts of genomes. Actively transcribed parts of genomes often have some of these regulatory proteins like SARC, ERB, and these proteins, because of that process, and remember, we've you know, suppressed transcriptional termination. Sometimes what will happen is you end up with extra genes that were next to wherever that retrovirus inserted now as part of the RNA, which is now then being moved around by the virus. And this is exactly how the retroviruses allowed us to discover oncogenes. The very first oncogene to be found was this SARC oncogene in Rouse sarcoma virus. Um, these viruses that had this gene in them caused tumorous growth. In the absence of this gene, they didn't. And so these are those <clears throat> tumor viruses that, again, everybody was studying before they studied HIV. Uh, yeah? So the virus is sequestering the, the, the oncogene from a prior host. Yeah, so the virus has picked up the oncogene and is now moving it to a different position. And usually now, because we've got LTRs, this is now no longer going to be appropriately regulated. It's going to be turned on all the time. So that's how these things are all causing um, cancerous development. And it turns out to be really, really useful if you're trying to study cancer, which normally, I don't know if anybody went to the biology seminar yesterday, which was actually not a great seminar, sorry, uh, that <clears throat> my own personal opinion there, uh, that uh, studying cancer usually is after multiple steps, multiple kinds of changes that have happened. Having a situation as a cancer researcher where you can treat cells with virus and then get cancer formation is really, really useful. Now, it turns out very few cancers are caused this way, but um, it's a great way of studying cancerous progression and looking at um, uncontrolled development. So there are, as again, hopefully not beating the dead horse here, um, many 
copies of these retroviruses in our genomes. Many of these are called the endogenous proviruses, the ERVs, or if it's in humans, the HERVs, um, together with retrotransposons. Um, this is actually a figure from the molecular biology text, um, where you have LTR, GAG, Paul, ENV just sitting in the host genome, and there are hundreds of these in our host genome, or our genome anyway. Um, and between those and the retrotransposons, which basically are identical to one of these viruses, only they now have lost the envelope genes, between these two, it's about 8% of our genome. Other parts of our genome that seem to be replicated through reverse transcription are these line elements and sign elements, and to some extent the process pseudogenes, which make up almost 40% of the genome. So, as I always love to say, you know, we're more viral than we are human, which is great and wonderful. Now, what does it mean? Who knows? Um, <clears throat> why I'm so virocentric here. So, in the last 15 minutes or so, um, I'd like to talk about HIV-1, which again is a whole course in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> a couple of really nice um, websites that I wanted to give a quick shout out to, um, scienceofhiv.org, um, brand new latest um, <clears throat> information on how HIV replicates. The reason that we care about HIV is there are probably 35 million people in the world who are infected with HIV, but 1 million in the US. And this is a very large number that a lot of people seem to ignore. Um, and one in six of these people probably doesn't even know that they're HIV positive. So they could be sharing it. They could also be coming down then with um, HIV-related disease, particularly AIDS, still causing tens of thousands of deaths every year, even though there are very good drugs, anti-HIV drugs that are available. And so the five in six can actually get the drugs. This used to be a much, you know, basically being infected by HIV was a death sentence. Um, that's no longer the case, which is wonderful. This is in my lifetime that this has happened. Uh, but still, mostly people who don't know can also then spread the disease. So be tested. I've been tested. Um, it's definitely a very good thing to do. So <clears throat> HIV structural proteins, um, very, very similar to the classic ones, with one exception <clears throat> here, which is this virus protein. Um, virion protein R here, which is part of the capsid. If you look at the capsid of HIV, it has this interesting non-icosahedral structure um, together with this, you know, extra viral protein which is in it. Otherwise, surface, transmembrane, matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid, protease, reverse transcriptase, integrase, all exactly the same. There's a little bit of confusion when people talk about HIV. Um, very often they talk about GP120 or GP41. GP just is glycoprotein, kind of like G that we've talked about in many other cases. Um, for other viruses, 120, just 120 kilodaltons. So this is the receptor binding protein, which is on the outside of the cell. GP41 is the fusion protein, also glycoprotein, present on the outside of the cell. Um, so those are those two um, proteins. The nucleocapsid itself, I guess not five years ago, um, there's a really nice high resolution structure that was determined of the capsid, um, mostly made up of hexamers with 12 pentamers that are associated with it. And there's a really amazing, um, I tried to find a copy of this um, VR version, where you can actually put on the goggles and walk inside the capsid. It's absolutely insane. Um, so. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll try and find that link if anybody, and you know, it works with Google Cardboard as well. So the genome should look really familiar with GAG, Paul, and N genes. Now we've got these extra genes that are associated with the HIV-1 genome. Um, VPR, which is one of those extra structural proteins, but also VIF, VPU, NEF, but most importantly for us, these TAT and REV proteins. These now overlap the other open reading frames. So this should sound a lot like things like AV and some of the other viruses that we've talked about before, where you have overlapping open reading frames. Um, these, as you can tell, they're split up like this, so they're all going to be spliced and different splicing. All those splices, however, happen from that same major splice site up here, 
at the very beginning of the genome. Just like all of those other retroviruses that will splice to ENV, these guys just have extra splicing. And these are just coding sequences that are present in the genomes that look just like um, what you have in terms of cellular um, splicing machinery. So how does HIV get inside the cell? There's a receptor and a co-receptor. The receptor is CD4. CD4 is a very common cell surface protein, particularly on immune cells. This is why HIV causes AIDS, because it breaks down immune cells, because they're the ones that get infected by um, CD4. But just CD4 by itself is insufficient. You also have to have a protein called CCR5 as a co-receptor. So the first thing that happens, you have binding of GP120, or the surface protein, to CD4. And basically, this holds the virus together until you have association with CCR5. Then this can cause membrane fusion through the transmembrane protein or GP41. Lots of people are trying to make vaccines. And that's what we'll be talking about in class today, um, our literature review class, um, looking at GP120, and because that's what the immune system sees, trying to make antibodies to it. Unfortunately, GP120 um, has a nasty tendency to not mutate itself, but there are lots of mutations that happen because the reverse transcriptase has very low fidelity, um, doesn't have any kind of proofreading. That was the other aspect, as well as this dissociation process. And also, you have recombination that happens between various different genomes. So very large amounts of nucleotide changes that happen in GP120, and also lots and lots of glycans, let's say it's GP because it's a glycoprotein, which will then block the activity of various different antibodies. This VPR protein, remember this is that extra virion protein, structural protein that's present in HIV, not in the other ones. This is what you need to get nuclear transport of the reverse transcribed double-stranded DNA um, into the nucleus. And this is why HIV can get into cells that are otherwise um, quiescent. There's some non-structural proteins. Again, mentioned them before. VIF, VPU, and NEF. Most important however, for us are going to be these TAT and REV proteins. So TAT is a transactivator of transcription. I actually don't like that particular terminology, but that's what they call it. I actually think it's an anti-terminator, I think, makes much more sense in terms of how it works, which you'll see in just a second. And then REV, the regulator of expression of virion proteins, this has to do with which of those messenger RNAs gets made and which of those messenger RNAs particularly gets transported out of the nucleus. So if we look first at TAT, there's um, the TAT protein, which interacts with the TAR sequence on the RNA. So this is the TAT interaction of RNA. TAR RNA makes a secondary structure. Normally when the RNA polymerase II transcribes, gets to this position, in the absence of TAT, the polymerase will terminate and you have no full length RNA and actually no messenger RNA for any of the proteins that are made from HIV-1. In the presence of TAT, however, you have anti-termination also with cyclin-dependent kinases, and now you can transcribe the whole rest of the provirus, making appropriate messenger RNAs, etc. Now, immediate question. How the heck do you get TAT if you don't have transcription? And the answer is you have a small amount of transcription. And that small amount of transcription is sufficient to get some of the TAT protein made. So if this always happened like this, you'd never see TAT in the first place. So there's a small amount which happens there. TAT binds to TAR, yes. And what we've shown in vitro is that you also need some of these cellular proteins, cyclins and CDKs, in order to get full transcription or full anti-termination, as I like to call it, um, from from TAP. So again, they call it a transactivator of transcription, but it really serves much more as an anti-terminator. So TAT, what was the other one? 
Rev. So, <laughs> Rev. <laughs> Rev is this so, viral protein that um, stimulates production of, <clears throat> say, viral proteins. Basically, what Rev does is it binds to the Rev response element. So, TAR binds to TAT, Rev binds to RRE, and it will move RNA in and out of the nucleus. So, Rev is made, binds to the Rev response element, that will take that messenger RNA out of the nucleus, allow it to be transcribed, then Rev comes back in, and this whole circle happens. In that process, the Rev protein uh, will make sure that you're getting all the messenger RNAs which are being made, but then you're going to need the final full length RNA to be made. That final full length RNA needs to be transported out of the nucleus as well. And this is the non-spliced version. So lots of splicing normally happens. You have to have non-spliced. You still have that psi sequence, which is what's binding to the <coughs> sequences um, that is nucleocapsid, which is going to get everything to the membrane and allow it to be put together. Um, but you also have to make sure that you have the <coughs> proteins being made before you have the final messenger RNA that gets taken out. So the Rev protein binding to the RRE, the RRE is actually in these spliced elements. So this RRE specifically is going to be involved in getting the non-spliced RNA out of the nucleus in order to then get it being packaged. How do you treat HIV? Um, again, as I mentioned, yes, a million people or so in the US are infected with HIV. Lots of HIV drugs have been developed. The, what most people call this is the heart therapy, so um, anti-retroviral um, therapy, but many of these are addressing the reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase is very specific to these retroviruses. Um, many of these are used, and you heard, probably heard about AZT, azadothymidine, they get incorporated by the reverse transcriptase but block further extension. Unfortunately, just like you see with GP120, lots of modifications that happen there. You also have low fidelity transcription, reverse transcription by the reverse transcriptase, so you end up with lots of resistance to these particular nucleotide inhibitors. So the original treatments were just treating reverse transcriptase. Then what was found is you had many, many mutants which were escaping these. So now pretty much all HIV therapy is multiple different drugs addressing multiple different aspects of the replication process. So we have inhibitors of the protease. We have inhibitors of the integrase as well as reverse transcriptase. And now people are trying to, although this is very early days, um, come up with ways to block uh, membrane fusion and entry. And way back when we talked about virus entry, we looked at GP41 and a particular peptide that stopped the conformational change in terms of getting fusion to take place. What the heck are these other proteins doing? Um, VIF, VPR, VPU, and NEF. We actually don't know that much about many of them. Um, you'll notice a bunch of question marks here at the end. I went online last night, probably when I forgot to upload the <laughs> um, presentation because I was too interested in looking up all of these other things. Um, VPU and NEF mostly seem to be involved in getting rid of the receptor on the outside of the cell. Why the heck would be getting rid of the receptor be a useful kind of thing to do? Well, what does GP120 bind to? CD4. When it's going out, do you want to come back and rebind the same cell that you're just infected? No, it's not very useful. So lowering the amount of CD4 seems to be a very important thing to do. This is just like what the orthomyxoviruses flu does. Neuraminidase, what does it do? Cuts off the sialic acid so that the virions will be released and can go ahead and bind to other cells that have not yet been infected. So that's all that I have 
for this. I hope that we'd have time to go through this animation. We'll do the same thing that we did with Lambda. So if people want to stick around, we can go through a annotated version of this animation. Otherwise, um, I will see you all on Monday for giant viruses. <laughs>